the Lord was surrounding you in ways you did not even realize. Amen. This morning, as every week, we're going to take a moment and pray for an area church. You know, we are the kingdom. We are the kingdom of God. And so it's our honor to pray for a different church every week. And this week, we're going to pray for Springs Church and Pastor Michael Patillo. And so I want to invite you to just, as a measure of just extending it, your hand towards the screen as we pray over them this morning. And so, Father, we thank you for Springs Church. Lord, we thank you that you have given them your vision to accomplish for your kingdom. Lord, I pray peace over their building. I pray safety over their congregation. Lord, I pray that your anointing would come with power and that many would come into the kingdom today because they have listened and they have obeyed your word. Father, I pray blessing over their family. And Lord, I pray that you continue to water the seeds that are being planted this morning at Springs Church in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. That was a good amen. Hey, listen, I just want to remind you of a verse as we continue our worship this morning, which is 2 Timothy 1.7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear. Let's say that together. For God has not given us a spirit of what? Fear, but of love and power and a sound mind. As I was praying for our congregation this morning, I just had this sense that many woke up kind of gripped with fear over certain areas. As you worship, just surrender those places to the Lord and allow him to bring his peace and power and love into those places. Let's continue to worship.
saves. It's the name that we call on. It's the name that's over all we know. God, this morning, would you just be here with us, God? Whatever we've walked in here with, whatever hurt, whatever pain, whatever joy, whatever happiness, God, you're over it all. You're over all we know. So God, we surrender, surrender that to you. We surrender ourselves to you, to who you are. God, because when you speak, things happen. When you tell the mountains they must go, they go. God, would you speak that into our lives? If you tell sickness it must leave and it's gone. God, when we're weak, you are strong. You are the one above it all. Church, we're going to learn a new song. It's called Over All I Know. Whatever you walked in with today, I encourage you just to lay it at the, the, the foot of the cross and declare that God is over it. God has it. He's good. He's good. He's good. Stand alone, you're the God. 
declare that we believe it, that we've seen it, and that our God is over all. I believe it, I have seen it, my God is over all. I believe it, I have seen it, church, let's lift up our voices this morning. something powerful about those lyrics right that he's the God over everything that we know the Psalms say that the Lord is enthroned over the flood over all the things that concern us over all the things that worry us over all the things that we're uncertain about he is the God who reigns over all of that amen and here's what I here's what I thought and I felt like the Holy Spirit just kind of gave me this unction in the middle of that song he's not just the God over all that I know he's also the God over everything I don't know all the things that I don't understand, all the things that I don't have control over. He's also the God over all of those things. And he's earned that right by just being who he is. We worship because God is worthy, amen? Whether he, whether he did another thing for us again ever or not, he's still worthy. And the good news is that he continues to work on our behalf. 
Romans tells us that he, he works on our behalf, that he, he works all things together, the things that we know, the things that we don't know, the things that we're confused about, the things that we're excited about, all of those things he works for the good according to his purposes for those who are, of us who are called according to him and who love him. So he's the God over all of that. And one of the ways that he proved that, Scripture says that we, we know that he loves us in, in that he came and he died for us before we said yes. While we were in the middle of our sin, while we were in the middle of our brokenness, while we were in the middle of all of our mess, for some of us even maybe actively cursing him, actively turning away from him, in the middle of that, he said, hey, I love you so much, I'm going to come and I'm going to take care of this for you. And one of the things that we do here at Story Church every week to remind us of those things, to remind us of his lordship, to remind us of his love, to remind us of his everlasting and steadfast compassion and love toward us is that we receive communion together. Just like we pray for another church every week to remind ourselves that it's not just about what's happening here on the corridor of airport and circle on the southeast side of Colorado Springs, but we're part of a bigger story. We remind ourselves through communion as well that we're a part of a much larger story, a much deeper story than maybe even we fully understand. And we know this in, in one way that, that, that Jesus on the night that he was betrayed was hanging out with his disciples, his closest friends, that in that moment, how many of you guys know that your last words you choose carefully? The things that you say to your friends and your loved ones before you pass, you want to make sure those things count. And these, this is one of those moments for Jesus. And so he gathered his friends and his closest friends around him and with the disciples, and he said, he took the bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it. And then he gave it. And he said, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. And in the same way, he took the cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it and said, take and drink. This is my blood poured out for your sins, for your forgiveness, for the establishment of the new covenant. He said, when you gather, do this in remembrance of me. And scripture tells us that we ought to be wise and mindful about these moments. We do it every week because we think it's important, but we also don't want to ever lose the majesty and the power and the mystery of what happens at the communion table. Just practically speaking, uh, it, we practice what's called open communion here at Story Church, which means that if you are a follower of Jesus, then you are welcome at the table. You don't have to have gone through catechism or a class or be a member or any of those things. If you follow Jesus and he is your Lord, you are welcome at the table. But we do this, we talk about this idea a lot around here that worship is, is really just remembering. It's reminding ourselves of who God is. It's reminding ourselves of his faithfulness and of his goodness. And so this is one of the primary ways that we do that. In fact, it's the way that Jesus said himself, do this in remembrance of me. So practically speaking, what will happen in a moment is the tables will open, we'll continue to sing together, and if you'll come down these center aisles and you can go to either side, whichever side is closest to you, and you can either tear off a piece of the bread and dip it in the cup or use the prepackaged options if that's more comfortable for you. And then if you wouldn't mind just going back to your seats toward the outside, it'll help with traffic flow. But before we do that, like I said, it's important that we take these moments seriously and that we are mindful of what's going on in our hearts before we participate in communion. And so if you wouldn't mind, just bow your head, close your eyes with me. And we're just gonna pray a prayer of forgiveness. Lord, we, we recognize that we have not lived up to your standards. We recognize that we have failed, that we have sinned. And though we know that we have done that in thought and in word, and indeed, we have, we have failed by what we have done and we have failed by what we have left undone. And so Lord, as you bring those things to our mind right now that we have failed and would you, first of all, Lord, we repent, which means we just turn away from that. We wanna to turn toward you, Jesus. And we ask that you would forgive us. Your word says that as we ask for forgiveness that you are faithful and just 
to not only forgive us, but to also un to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so Holy Spirit, I pray that by your power and presence in this space, that as we receive communion this morning, as we remember the price that Jesus paid for each and every one of us, that you would forgive us, that you would cleanse us, that you would heal us, continue to sanctify us and make us more and more yours. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your great love, your great sacrifice for us. We honor you and we worship you. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. amen. Let's continue to worship as we receive communion. The tables are open.
Great are you, Lord. Can we sing it again? Great are you, Lord. Great. give back the breath that you've given us. We're going to pour it out in praise to you because you're worthy, God. You are worth our attention. You are worth our focus. You are worth our lives and our very breath because they're, they all belong to you to begin with. We honor you, God. We worship you. We love you. We love you, God. And Holy Spirit, we thank you for your presence in this space. We thank you that you are in all places at all times with all wisdom, power, knowledge, and love, but that you also inhabit the praises of your people. And we just sense your presence right now, and we just say thank you. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for reminding us of your love for us. Thank you for your faithfulness, your steadfast love. Thank you for who you are. And Spirit of God, as we continue to worship you through studying your word, through prayer, through giving, through song, would you help us to sort of transition our hearts and our minds to hearing specifically from you through your word right now? Help us to hear what you're saying. Lord, I, I pray that you would have a specific moment and word for every person in this room, every person that's watching online. And Lord, we just, we, we say yes. We invite you to come and speak to each of us. We give you permission to mess with us today. We give you permission to come and, 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 and rightly order our lives and our hearts and our minds, God. Would you come and do that for us? We love you. We thank you. And it's in the strong, risen name of Jesus that everyone said, amen. 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 Well, before you get too comfortable, once you... Uh, Stand to your feet, say hi to your neighbors, greet one another. Elementary students, you can meet your teachers in the back, and we'll get started here in just a moment. doing? Doing well this morning? Yeah. Hey, it's good to see you. My name is Brandon. I get to serve as the lead pastor here, and I'm so grateful for you joining us this morning here in person. Or for those of you who are joining us online, thank you. Uh, thank you for taking time out of your Sunday to be with us. Um, before we get uh, rolling too hard, uh, you may have noticed that Jamond was not on stage this morning, nor his beautiful wife, Keisha. That's because they gave, well, they, she gave birth <laughs> to a beautiful new boy named Miles, and I think we have a picture of them. So Miles, Nael, um, healthy, happy, 
six pounds, something, swaddling clothes, the whole nine yards. Uh, and so Dee and I got to go visit them in the hospital this week, and, uh, and they are doing really well, but we, we figured it probably wasn't nice of us to say, hey, would you just go ahead and lead worship anyway this week? <laughs> I know, Keisha, you've got, you know, a two-year-old and a baby, but, you know, if you could just sing anyway, that'd be great. So, no, we just want to make sure we're taking care of them, and we're celebrating. We're growing the church the old-fashioned way, right? So, um, moving on. So, we've been in a series for quite a bit now, like, I don't know, 13 weeks or something, called Who Do You Think You Are? And in this series, we've been examining the, uh, primarily the Apostles' Creed, and we've looked at the Nicene Creed as well, because we recognize that the creeds are the primary, the fundamental, the cardinal components of what we believe as Christians, right? And so we've been going line by line and looking at that and studying that, and the reason we've been doing it that way is we, we, because we believe that this year is the year that we what? Anybody remember? Level up. That's right. And so in order to level up, we have to get back to the fundamentals. We have to go back to the basics. The Nuggets won last night because those, jo- those jokers, that joker and the rest of those jokers spent a lot of time focusing on fundamentals. They, f- they focused on making sure they knew how to hit free throws. They focused on making sure they knew how to dribble the ball. They focused on making sure they knew how to pass effectively and understand the plays. And before they could get into pick and rolls and two-man games, and I'm saying things that I'm, I just hear announcers say, I don't even know what I'm talking about. I'm a hockey guy. But it's fun to watch. <laughs> before they could do any of those more complex things or zone or man-to-man or whatever, like before they could in- understand those more complex things, they had to know the fundamentals first, Right. And so for us, we have to know the fundamentals of our faith. We have to understand what the basics are. So with that in mind, what I'd like to do, and actually I'm going to, I apologize, this is kind of blocking things, but it's going to make sense in a little bit. Uh, I'm going to invite you to stand and let's recite the Apostles' Creed together uh, as a statement of our faith, but also as a way to sort of preset what we're going to be talking about today. So we believe in God together. We believe in God, the Father Almighty creator of heaven and earth. We believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You go ahead and be seated. So you can see we're on the communion of saints. We're getting really close to the end of this journey before we start the next. But today we're going to be talking, and actually this is a two-week series now. Like We have kind of a mini-series. It's amazing how, how deep you can go with four little words, the communion of the saints. So what does that phrase mean? A couple of weeks we talked about one holy Catholic and apostolic church and sort of that meaning the the global comprehensive church that is meant to be healthy, self-sustaining, self-multiplying movement of disciples and disciple making. So what is the communion of saints? Well, as you may imagine, it's significantly more complex than and nuanced than those four words might imply on their own. And this stage is messing with me right now. So with that in mind, this week is going to be, like I said, part one of, part, of two parts describing the communion of saints. But the most simple way of defining the communion of saints is to say that it's the body of Christ, right? And that in and of itself is a mouthful. We're going to get into that in a minute. But, and we know that God is the same. Scripture teaches us he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, right? He's past, he's present, and he's future. In fact, the, the phrase when he tells Moses who he is, when Moses said, hey, should, who should I tell the Egyptians that has sent me? He said, tell them that I am sent you. And, and in college, my Hebrew professor taught me that that phrase, I am, in Hebrew, actually maybe is better translated saying, I will continue to be who I continue to be. So he was, he is, and he will be. And I, th- I believe that the same thing is true to a degree with the church and the communion of saints. The body of Christ is past, it is present, and barring the Lord coming back, and actually, no, even when he comes back, we'll still be, continue to be the communion of saints. So it's past, present, and future. So we have, to, we have to define that a little bit. We have to understand what the body of Christ is, and, and then we have to look at how to live that out in a healthy way. And it kind of includes everything, right? It's the saints who have gone before. 
and we're going to read a passage on that uh, later on. We'll actually talk about that next week really, really in depth. It's those who come after us. Remember, God is eternal. He's outside of and beyond space, the space-time continuum. And the language in these, in, particularly in Hebrews 12, where it says we have this great cloud of witnesses that's watching us, it, it really references that outside and beyond as well as the now imminent. So we, we, we worship a God who is transcendent and imminent, which means he's, he's beyond and he's right here. And the same is true about the church in a different way, that it is beyond us, it is, it is expansive beyond us, it goes beyond us in the, in the past and in the future, but it is also right here, right now. Look at one another and say, I am the church. Now turn to your other neighbor or turn back to the same one and say, you are the church. <laughs> See, the church isn't a place, it's not an organization, it's not a building, it is a people. The church is fundamentally the people of God. So, a good way of saying that the communion of sa- what the communion of saints is, is that it is the all-time beyond and now and local group of believers, a group of people who follow Jesus. And we're going to look at that. We're going to look at some famous passages about that. But really, all of this is a part of being part of humanity and part of being a part of the body of Christ, specifically. And 1 Corinthians chapter 12 gives us some inclination about these things. Starting in verse 7, it says, Now to each one, everyone say each one. one. So that means, so each one is you and me and her and it's like all of us, right? Each one is each one, right? Everyone. So each one, to each one of the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. So each of us has something that is meant for all of us. Each of us has something that is meant for all of us. And we go on in verse 12 through 14. It says, just as a body, the one has many parts, but all its parts form one body, so it is with Christ. We are all baptized by one spirit as to form one body, whether we're Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Going on. Now, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I don't belong to the body, it would not for the foot, it would for that, for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. Everyone say intentionality. God formed you and me and us with a great degree of intentionality. As it is, there, is one, there are many parts, but there is one body. The eye can't say, I don't need you, and the head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. All of the parts need one another. I'm going to skip through this really quickly here because Paul is showing us, Paul is showing us that even in a unified body, there is the opportunity for discord. I'm going to say that again. Even in a unified body, there's opportunity for discord. Well, how does that happen? Well, if a hand or a foot or an eye says, I don't get to be what I want to be, so I want to peace out, well, the body doesn't work properly, right? The body doesn't actually work that way. The body actually needs all of the parts, say all of us. And it says, in fact, it says that when one part suffers, all suffer. And further, our bodies, to work properly, they need, they need all those parts, and they need all of the different systems that exist within our, 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 our entire being, as well as the whole. And for the whole to work, both the systems and the parts have to function in what we call order and mutual voluntary submission. Order and mutual voluntary submission. So the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are an example of order and of mutual voluntary submission. The Father is, 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 is the head and, it, and is set an order in place for all things. And the Son submits to and, ob- and obeys the Father and also is supported by the Spirit. And they worship and honor and glorify one another all the time. There's this mutuality. There's this decision. In fact, we're created for community because we're created in the image of God. And God himself is community. 
God himself is relational. And so we're meant to live relationally. We're meant to live as many parts of one body where we mutually and voluntarily submit to one another for the good of all of us. I'm going to say that one more time. We all live and mutually and voluntarily submit to one another for the good of all of us. In fact, there's a, there's a saying that submission isn't actually submission until we disagree. That hurts a little bit, right? Like, because, oh, but, but I disagree. Okay, cool. It's sort of like the, uh, Francis Chan talks about worship, and he says, you know, someone came up to him one, said, one Sunday and said, oh, I don't really like that song. He's like, that's okay. We weren't worshiping you. Just go ahead and sing the song anyway. I disagree with that song. I don't like that, I don't like that lyric. Well, I don't like the way she's saying that, or I don't like, I don't care. Like, it, worship anyway, because God is worthy whether we feel like it or not. We're not worshiping one another. We're not here to just sort of get our warm and fuzzies and then go out and, and do whatever the rest of the week. I'm grateful for the warm and fuzzies. I'm grateful for the way that the Holy Spirit makes me feel empowered and encouraged and joyful and at peace. But I also have to be grateful for when the Holy Spirit convicts me of something I'm doing stupid. And it's in those moments that I choose whether or not I'm actually submitting. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to play like a uh, high school biology teacher for a second here. Actually, with my level of knowledge, I'm going to play elementary school biology teacher for just a moment here, all right? And I have to have like my little notes. Okay, so we're talking about the body of Christ and how that functions. Obviously, this is a metaphor. Obviously, no metaphor is perfect, but I think this one gives us a bunch of things to hang truth on, okay? So we got the body, right? We, we start with the body and we go, okay, all right, here's the, here's the skull and here's the spinal cord and that spinal cord kind of goes all the way down and I got some ribs coming out of here and I got like, a, is it a clavicle? Is that your shoulder bones or your uh, collarbone? Thank you. See, I told you, elementary school, y'all. And then I got my arm bone, which is connected to my elbow, which is connected to my hand. And then I got my other one over here, and I got my hand over here. And then I've got like my hip bones, and then I've got my leg bone, which is connected to the knee bone, and the knee bone is connected to the shin bone, and the shin bone, and I got my feet right on both sides, okay? So this is our skeletal system, right? This is the structure of our lives. This is, without this, we're just a bag of meat. That's a weird thing to say. But it's true, without bones, without a structural system, we couldn't do anything. It doesn't matter how strong you are, if your bones don't function or if they're non-existent, then you're just a blob and you can't really do anything, right? So we're going to put on top of the bones, we're, gonna, we're actually going to say, all right, well, within that, we got a brain, right? I'm gonna, we got a nice little green brain. There's, we'll, call it, it's, we'll call it greenish gray because it's all gray matter, right? So then we got the brain, and it's connected to the cervical system, and all, all of our nerves go all the way down here. And then, so that's our main primary central nervous system, and then we've got nerves that just go everywhere, right? They're just all over. And if you've ever seen a diagram of, like, the nervous system, there's just a grip of them, right? There's a bunch. So we got that, right? And then we're going to add on to this, we've got, oh, well, we've got our cardiovascular system. So we've got a mouth and a nose, and we've got to breathe. And so when we breathe, that comes into our esophagus, or the esophagus, whatever. It comes into our throat, and then it goes into our lungs, and we've got these lung things here. And then those lungs connect to a bunch of veins. Those also go all throughout the body, right? Right? Are we tracking so far? Okay, great. Great. All right, so then within that, I've also got, well, I can't do much without my big biceps like Joaquin, um, right? Or, you know, don't forget leg day. So I got some muscles around here. I got some more muscles around here. And all these muscles are what give me strength and the ability to have agility and strength and endurance and quickness and balance and all of the things, right? Flexibility. And then, what am I missing? What am I missing? Oh, well, you got to eat, right? So I got a gastrointestinal system as well. So I got a stomach down here and the food comes down. I'm not going to describe about what the, re the rest of that process is, but you all know it happens a couple times a day. We get an intake and an outtake on all this stuff, right? So there are these different systems. So we start out, maybe we've got the neurological system, right? The neuro system. And then we have, I'm looking at my notes. We got the cardio system. And then we've got the gastro system. 
And then we've got the skeletal muscular system. And then within this, we don't see this in the same way, but we've also got an emotional system, right? We've got a bunch of feelings. <laughs> I feel a certain kind of way about all those feelings. And then we also have, like, within that context, we also have a limbic system, right? And the limbic system is like the, the four Fs, right? Fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. Like, when we, when we encounter danger and trouble, we go into one of those four Fs. All right, so we've got all these different systems. And they are independent, and they are also interdependent, right? They need one another. And then we haven't even gotten into, like, I got a hand, and I got an eye, and I got a toe, and I got a gluteus maximus, whatever, right? We have all these other parts of our body, but these things have to function together for this to work. And they have to function in order, and they also have to function in mutual voluntary submission, right? So there are, there's an appropriate time for each of these ones individually to have a takeover, right? So my neurological system, my brain says, you know what? I am too tired. I have not rested for a long time. And guess what? Lights out eight hours. My brain will put me to sleep if the rest of my, if, if it recognizes that everything else needs a rest, right? So there's an appropriate time for this to take over and say, nope, I'm doing something else. And everybody else has to submit. Make sense? Okay, so the, the cardio system, like if I'm running a race and I finish the race, I have to stop doing everything else and just what? Breathe, right? Like, okay, I got to get more oxygen in my system. I've put out a bunch of energy. I put out a bunch of effort. And so in this moment, my cardiovascular system has to say, hold on, guys, stop everything else. I need to focus on just getting enough breath so that these other things will continue to work. Our gastrointestinal system, like you're eating some chicken, you think it's tasted real good, but you didn't know, your gastro system knows that you ate something with food poisoning in it. Guess what? The gastro system needs to take over and expel that which is poisonous to the body, right? So there's a moment where the gastro system takes over. There's a moment where like the emotional system takes over. And I, I would recommend this as little as possible because <laughs> y'all know that we, we make a bunch of bad decisions based on just our feelings. And feelings are good. Feelings are God-given. God has feelings, but God is not run by his feelings, Okay. So it's different to have feelings and acknowledge them as part of the process and, and as part of information, but it's not necessarily okay for us to be run by them all the time. But there are some times when it's helpful. You know what? You know what a really helpful time for my emotions to take over my life was? When I fell in love with my wife. Because, I, because of the emotional attachment of what was going on there, I made a commitment to the greatest and most fulfilling relationship in my life that I might not have made if I didn't have those feelings. So in a moment, it's okay to, take that, to have that take over. And then we talk about the limbic system, right? In a moment of danger, it is okay for that, for that system to say, hey, get out of here, there's a bear, right? They say that whatever, whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger, except for bears. They will just kill you dead. <laughs> so it's appropriate, it's okay on occasion for each of these to go, nope, it's time for me to take over. And everything else goes, all right, cool, I'm good for now. But what's not okay is when we get stuck. And I think we get stuck in these spaces most often, right? We get stuck in our feelings. We get stuck in offense. We get stuck in our fear. We get stuck in trauma, whatever. And, I, and hear me, like, we all do it. This is not like you're, you should, no. This is we all get, we get stuck. How many of you all have felt like you've been stuck once or twice? Okay, almost everyone here is honest. It's okay for our emotions to take over in a moment. It's okay for the limbic system to take over in a moment. What's not okay is for us to live that way. And I think a lot of us do. I know in moments of my own life, I do. I get stuck there as well. And we get stuck, at, we get, in fact, we get stuck in our emotions. Like there's that, that emotion that helped me make the decision to get married. But if I stay in just the emotional component of that, and I don't feel as good as I did when I was 24 years old because things aren't as fun as they always were and I don't have the butterflies I have every time I talk to my wife then maybe I opt out or we get stuck in our limbic system I got hurt before in that trauma so I'm just going to remain in one of my F's 
and I'm going to just define Fs right now just for carefully. Fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. Paul talks about this, that there's this, this war within us for, between the different systems in our mind and our will and our emotions and the spirit and our senses. There's this war within us. And Romans 7, 21 through 25 says it this way. So I find this law, like this rule at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. By the way, we talk a lot about the idea of the flesh versus the spirit. Right? You've, maybe you've heard that in church before. Like, I don't want to live according to the flesh. I want to live according to the spirit. And the flesh, the, the word flesh, like, it, it means flesh. It means our body. It means our, our carnal, actual, emotional desires and all that. But Paul says it both here. He says, but there's, there's, a, there's the spirit, there's also my flesh, and there's also my mind. So we can also get caught up in just our minds, in just our thinking, and just thinking, oh, well, I know what the right thing is to do. I know the path. I know, I know, I know, I know. And in the middle of that, we can miss what the spirit of God is trying to do in and through us because we're so caught up in what we think we already know. Ever met somebody that like you can't actually tell them something they don't know? Those are not fun conversations, are they? I wonder how God feels about us that way all the time. <laughs> Especially since he knows so much more than we do to begin with, right? It's like Nick and Liz, right? Like they are, uh, they're literal rocket scientists. Literal, actual rocket scientists. Like they're engineers, PhD, like they're stupid smart. It'd be like me going to them and say, and say hey guys, I just want you to know how satellites work. Let me, just, let me just tell you how like gravity flows and how all this works together and all the things. And they're like, uh, thank you, Captain Obvious. I wonder if God feels like that with us sometimes. Hey, thanks, Captain Obvious. Um, I created you. I know you better than you think you know yourself. And so maybe you should just like simmer down a little bit. Maybe you should listen to me instead of making me listen to you. And I, yeah, Right. How many times do we spend our entire time in prayer with God making him listen to us when what we really need to do is listen to him? Guilty. Guilty. So Paul is saying there's this, there's this war within us, both our, our mind and our, which is our, our, our soul, it's our mind, our will, and our emotions, and our spirit, which is the sort of more eternal, foundational component of who we are, and then our physical body. We are triune beings in a similar way, not the same, but in a similar way to who God is as a triune being. But there's this war within us that doesn't exist with him. In fact, there's a saying about God that he is the only being anywhere for whom essence and existence are the same. For us, our essence, man, we're working that out, right? We're trying to figure out who we are. We're trying to figure out what we're called to do or what we're built to do or who we're supposed to hang out with or what we're supposed to do for work or how we're supposed to spend our money or name the thing, but we exist. But God's very existence is essence. God's very existence is certainty and clarity and order and mutual voluntary submission and community and love and compassion and power. And all those, those are just who he is. He didn't have to try harder. He didn't have to work it up. He didn't have to like give himself a pep talk. He didn't have to do any of those things because he just is who he is. We're trying to figure it out still. So Paul's talking about this and he says, thanks be to God who delivers me through Christ Jesus our Lord. So then in, I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. So they're constantly interacting, our thoughts and our feelings and our emotions and our reason, our limbic systems, and even just our physical bodies interacting. And honestly, all of it's struggling for power. The body wants to be in charge. The mind wants to be in charge. The emotions want to be in charge. The spirit wants to be in charge. The, my desire for a Twinkie right now wants to be in charge. And each of them, like I said, have circumstantially driven functionality that both empowers and regulates each of those areas. There are times when the body just has to take over. There are times when the mind has to take over. There are times when the, we talked about this, right? In fact, there, there are times when my mind needs to take over, right? My reason, my will, my, my will and my reason need to, need to have a little conversation. 
Because there are times, based upon how people be peopling, that I want to punch people in the face. Yes, your pastor just said that sometimes he wants to punch people in the face. I'm just being honest. And sometimes it's you. I love you. But my mind and my reason have to go, wait a minute. If I randomly punch people in the face, there are going to be consequences for them. Oh, I'm stronger than you think I am. But there will also be consequences for myself. And I don't necessarily want to endure that or have to have you endure it either. There are times that are appropriate for takeover. There are times that are appropriate for mutual voluntary submission. And, and we get this metaphorical look into the mind. Uh, there's, there's, there's a movie that just came out, well, not just came out, several years back, uh, called Inside Out. I think we have a picture of that, actually, right? Okay, so this is a, and I, I apologize for everybody on that side if you can't see it very well. You can turn around and look at the confidence monitor. You can see it there if you need to. But it, we, this, is a, this is a metaphorical look inside the mind of little Miss Riley, and little Miss Riley, I think she's like 12 years old. She's just moved from the Midwest all the way over to San Francisco, and she's trying to figure out her life. And in the mind, you see these different characters. So you've got joy, and you've got disgust, and you've got anger, and you've got fear, and you've got sadness. By the way, those are the five most basic functions of human emotion. Scientists have identified over 200 of them, but most of us live in these five. We don't really, I, I'm just mad. I don't even know why I'm mad. I'm just mad. Or, I'm just afraid. I don't know why I'm afraid. Or I'm just joy. I'm just happy. Everything's good. I don't even, you know what? The nugget's won. I'm happy. It's good. We don't necessarily dig in all the time to what these are. And that, and there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a time and a place for that. And I think it's helpful and healthy for us to dig into some of those things a little bit more. It's always helpful to have more clarity. You, what you, <laughs> you can't heal what you don't reveal right? You, you, have to, you have to define things more clearly because if you define the wrong thing and try to heal that, you might miss what's actually going on. If I'm, if I'm trying to, you get the idea. I, I think a lot of times we go after symptoms and we forget about the cause. And so our symptoms, are, are those emotions, what, what I want to, can we go back to that picture for one second? What I want to point out in this is that the way that our culture views decision-making in our lives is through the lens of emotion. It's good to have emotion. We talked about that. God has emotion. In fact, you can look through the scripture. There are times he's angry. There's times he's sad. There's times that he's rejoicing. There are times that he's disappointed. There's times that he's empowered. There's all kinds of different emotions that God feels, and he's, in, he's imbued us with those as well, but we're not meant to be run by them. And so the whole premise of this movie is, is joy going to win? Is fear going to win? Is sadness going to win? Is anger going to win? Which of the emotions is going to drive the bus? And sometimes it's okay. It's okay to have a temporary takeover in this mutual moment, right? But our emotions are not meant to run us. But if this is the state of things in our culture, and it's the, this is the internal war that Paul talks about in our lives, both within us as individuals and the metaphor of the church being a body, there are two questions I have. One, how do I fix me? And two, how do I fix we? Because it's both. I have to fix me. I have to work on me in order for we to work better. In fact, I, I can't even tell you how many times as a pastor I've sat down with a couple who are in crisis and they say, I just need him to go to counseling. <laughs> well, she needs to get this fixed. You know what the point of counseling is? For me to get fixed. For me to get fixed. Because if I fix me, then I'm going to look at her differently. And if she fixes her, she's going to look at, thank you, Lord, for fixing her so she can look at me better because I need all the better I can get. But when we focus on, oh, you need this and you need that, and like, what, what's the old saying? Like, one, point, one finger pointed at you, three at me. It's true. We've got to work on us. And, and, it, and for us to work on the church as a whole, for us to say, hey, we want this body to be a healthy, life-giving place with authentic community and vibrant spirituality and, and valuing the Imago Dei. If we want to do that, well, guess what? It starts with who? Me. We've said this a bunch. I'm going to say it again. The old thing, right? Here's the church. Here's the steeple. Open up the doors and see all the... So if there's a problem with the church, it's a problem with what? People. 
Oh, crap, I'm a people. Oh, man, I don't know what to do with that. I got to work on me. And if I think there's something wrong with us, with, with, the, with the body of Christ, then I got to go, okay, well, what about that can I do? And you, you've, you've heard us talk about calling and destiny and purpose and all those things around here. And one of the ways that we look and find our purpose, by the way, we do something every month, the first three weeks of the month, called Story Church Next. And if you'd like to know a little bit more about the story of Story Church and how, and then a little bit more about your story and then how those stories intersect and move forward together, it's three weeks, it's 45 minutes a week, it's nine o'clock every, uh, the first three Sundays of every month. It's a fan, we'll feed you, we'll take care of you. It's a great way for you to figure out some of this stuff out. But one of the ways that we've learned about how I discover my purpose and my passion, sometimes there's a back door. Sometimes the back door to my purpose is what makes me mad. What frustrates me is often, see, there's, there's another lie that our culture has believed that hate is the opposite of love. It's not. Hate and love are both passion. The opposite of love is indifference. It's when I'm like, I just peace out altogether and I, or I don't even care. That's way more dangerous. If you tell me you're mad at me, okay, cool, we can work with that because now I know you care. But if you just peace out, I can't do anything with that. So one of the back doors to purpose is by looking at what frustrates us. And so I, I love when someone comes to me and say, oh man, like I, it was just too loud in church day. I, I, all I could hear, and I, I'll, I'll start listening. Okay, all right, so you're frustrated about something. There's a passion here. Okay, yeah, I noticed that all I could hear was cymbals and, and I couldn't hear the guitar. I'm like, oh, okay, so you have a passion for music. You have a passion for audio engineering. So if you're frustrated about that, you know what's a great way to help with that? Man, what, would you love to serve? I would love for you to help with our sound and tech team. Or, man, I just, I don't feel like I'm connected here, and I, I don't feel like there's a group for me. I, I, I need a smaller place where I can connect. Oh, okay, cool. Would you like to start a group? Like, there's, there's it's a back door to our passion. And if, and if there's something wrong with we, I need to start fixing it with me. But how do we do that, right? Well, I think the way we do that, actually, let me, let me, uh-oh, it's getting real now. That's like the coolest invention ever, by the way. If you've seen my office, you know that I'm a complete whiteboard addict. So I need all the space I can get. So here's, here's how we just talked about a little bit, right? Like this idea about the way that our systems function. And I think this is true as individuals and it's true as a church, right? So over here we've got our, our neuro, right? Our neuro and how do I put that? And skeletal system that work together. And then we have our uh, ba -ba 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 -ba, our cardio and gastro and muscle system that all work together. And then we've got our emotional and limbic system that all work together. And then we've got our spirit over here as well. And that is doing its thing. And, and, I th and, and we, we are this, this triune being that is body, soul, and spirit, right? And, and, and what happens is that we like, we go, oh, well, there are times when I go, oh, I feel like the Lord is telling me this, and I'm going to act this way, and that's great. And there are times when my emotions are saying, hey, I got to go over here, and we act this way, Right? And then there are times when my, my, my mind takes over. There are times when my cardio takes over. Like all these different things have these moments. And you can, like this is messy, right? This is messy. But here's, here's how we fix this. Acts 2, 1 through 12 says this. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. In fact, one, uh, one version says that they were all in one accord, which tells us that the apostles drove Hondas. I told you, my, my theory on humor is I'm here to entertain me <laughs> if you laugh at the bonus. Suddenly a sound like a, by the way, today's Pentecost Sunday. We're celebrating this as a church, as a global church. This is the Sunday that we celebrate the Holy Spirit's outpouring on the believers. So suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. 
Now they're staying in Jerusalem where there were God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they said, aren't all these people that are speaking, aren't they Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? There's Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and other parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors in Rome, both Jews, Cretans, Arabs. So we've got like a bunch of people. And I just want to throw one little thing in, one little nugget in this. So we know there were 12 apostles, right? I just named off almost 20 different languages. So that would tell me that this isn't just for the apostles. This is beyond just the apostles. This is something that goes beyond. So all these different people are saying, hey, we're all hearing them praise God in our tongues and amazed and perplexed. They ask one another, what does this mean? And they, they say, oh, they're, they're probably just drunk. And Peter was like, no, man, it's nine in the morning. We're not drunk yet. <laughs> Facts. So... <laughs> The, but he's saying, no, 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 this is the Spirit of God in, in informing us and, in, and empowering us to be who he's called us to be. And as a result of us being filled with the Holy Spirit, then there's, there's an order that takes place. Even though this is a chaotic moment, there's an order that's already evidenced, right? Because they're not just speaking in some random language that nobody knows. They're speaking in languages that everyone there can have a connection point to. So there's an order to this, all right? So here's what happens. We have Pentecost, and I'm going to just draw on here the Spirit of God. So pi is, is the first word of pneuma, which is spirit. Uh, theta is the first word of theos, which is God. So the Spirit of God at Pentecost changes some things. Now we have our spirit, and we have our neuro system. And then we have our emotional and limbic system. And then we have our body, which is incorporating all of these things. And then we have actions. And what is supposed to happen is that this informs this. And then this informs this and actually mutually communicates. It's not just all the time one direction on this. And then this informs this, and then, uh, then we act in accordance with the scripture, with, in accordance with the spirit, with what, what God is saying to us, not just what we think, feel, or physically feel. Okay, there's an order to this. And there are moments in which, like we said, there are moments that there are appropriate takeovers right? It's appropriate at times for the body to say, nope, it's time to shut down. There are appropriate times for the gastric, like we talked about that. But as a general rule, this is how this should be functioning. This, so, because here, here's, the, here's the trick to it. Can we find truth in our minds? Yes? Right? In, in reason, right? There's actually something called the Wesleyan quadrilateral in which we understand how to make decisions, how to like understand what God is saying. Like, we, we look at we look at scripture, we look at tradition, we look at reason, and we look at our experience. And those things together sort of form like a lens through which we see the rest of the world. When we, when we have all four of those things in mind, we're like, oh, this is probably a good thing to think about. This is probably a good way to go, okay? So, yes, in our minds, we can find truth. And we just said that God has emotions and created us with emotions. So there is truth emotionally. And there are, there are things that are true that we can find through the experience of our bodies as well. But, but I want you to notice something, that these are all lowercase t's. This is the only capital T truth. The Spirit of God expressed through the Word of God is the only capital T truth. But we go, no, my emotions feel this way, so I have to, th in fact, most people make decisions based upon their emotions, and then justify it based on reason. We make decisions about how we feel, and then because we want to feel good about how we felt, we tell people how smart we were. Oh, well, you know, I, it's, uh, I, I bought that truck because, uh, well, it was uh, Consumer Reports' best, uh, most reliable model that year. That may be true, but you liked the way the truck looked and the way you drove it before you had that decision. 
Sometimes it's reversed. I, I'm not saying we do it all the time, but I am saying that we elevate each of these places more than they ought. And, it, and if, we will, if we want to heal what's broken in us, if we want to begin to make better decisions, if we want to be the body of Christ that God has called us to be, and we want all of those systems to function the way they're meant to, then we have to live here. We have to live here. And the, the other thing about this, we don't always think like clearly necessarily about all the delineated functions. Like I don't think about breathing unless I'm really out of breath, right? I don't think about sleeping. I don't have to think about my heart beating. I don't have to think about my brain sending the signals to all the different parts. Of my, I don't have to think about those things. Those are autonomic. They happen automatically the way that God created my, my body to function and yours as well. I don't have to think about all those things. There are things that I think about. Like I think about, oh, I want chicken. Okay, well, what kind of chicken do I want? Do I want Cajun chicken or do I want, I don't want that plain mess that was just boiled. That tastes nasty. Like I, I think about some of this stuff, but I don't have to think about the way my body digests it. I don't, I don't have like conscious processes about that, but I think there are some things about the way that the body is meant to function individually and corporately that bears just like looking at really briefly. And again, we're going to look at some of this stuff more in depth next week. So I don't, I'm not going to dig in super deep on this, but I just want to look at like the cardio system and, and the gastro system for just a second. Like our, the cardio is like our breath and our lung capacity, right? And that is what brings nutrients to the rest of our body to function. Without it, our minds don't send the right signals. Without Without it, our, our muscles can't function the way that we can't move, we can't walk, we can't balance, we can't think, we can't talk, we can't do any of the things if we don't first have breath. What was the first thing God gave us? His breath. And then we also, like the gastrointestinal system, like we need food, right? We need breath most, then we need water, then we need food. And then we can talk about Maslow's hierarchy of needs after that, but those are the things that we need first. Breath, water, and food. But the gastrointestinal system is what processes water and food. It's the, it's the nutrient processing uh, component of our bodies. But it, it by itself can't do its job. I can just eat and it flushes through me, but if my cardio system isn't working too, then the, neuro, the, the nutrients don't get to the rest of my body the way that they're meant to. There's a delivery system involved on both sides of those that are interdependent of one another. They need one another to function and for the rest of our bodies to function the way that they do. And I just think it's interesting to me that the breath, the same word that we use for breath is in, in, in the Greek and in the Hebrew is, is, is the same word we use for spirit. Now, I'm not saying that our breath is spirit. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not getting weird new age about that. Not, that's what I'm saying. What I am saying is that we need the Spirit of God. We need to breathe in the Spirit. Yeah, and worship team, if you want to come, that'd be great. We need to breathe in the Spirit of God that, uh, that, that it, it infuses everything else we do. And the food that we need to take in, metaphorically speaking, is the Word of God. Jesus said man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that pr proceeds from the mouth of the Father. We need the Word of God, but if we just take the Word of God in us and we just read the Bible all day long, but we don't ask the Spirit to come in and inform that, then it never gets imbued through the rest of our system. It th those nutrients that we would get from the Word never get anywhere else because all we're doing is eating it and spitting it back out. And in the same way, if we just say, oh, I just want the Spirit, I just want the Spirit, I just want the Spirit, I don't need the Word, then we got a bunch of breath, but we're going to starve to death. And so the way that we fix these things, the way that we get our lives in the right healthy order is that we, 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 we ensconce ourselves, we feed, we feast on the Word of God, and we do so by inviting the Spirit of God to come and breathe on that process, to come and breathe on us, to come and help us to understand what He meant to say, because this is the beautiful thing about the Word of God. It, is, it says that the Word of God is living and active, and when we take that in, there's something powerful about it in and of itself. And that, and that, yes, there are very intentional, historically, culturally, contextual ideas that this passage was written for this group of people from this person in this circumstance. And that is the primary meaning of that text, okay? 
And you can't ever change what that is. You should never try to change what that is. But at the same time, because God is just so gracious and so good, by the power of his spirit and by the power of his alive and active word, he also allows that metaphor, that idea that he spoke to the, the Israelites in Babylon about the fact that there was a hope and a future for them, that we can also go, hey, wait a minute, that applies to me as well today because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the church was yesterday, today, and forever. And so I get to the meaning out of that for my personal life as well. But it's not about just me. In fact, we, it, it's about the we first, and then it's about me, and then I get to feed back into that. Does it make sense? Okay. So here's the thing. There are all these different systems, all these different components, but if we can just really focus on those two. For, if we're talking about focusing on the fundamentals, we need breath and we need water and food. And then the rest of that stuff can kind of begin to come together. But in order for those things to get done in a healthy way, we've got to nourish ourselves. And we've got to take this idea of, of mutual voluntary submission seriously. And, th and the way that we do this is to be, is to be people of Pentecost. It's to be people who are intentionally and willfully and longingly filled with the Spirit of God. Romans 8, 12 through 17 says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it's not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if, the, if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. It's by that spirit that we're able to cry out to him, Abba, Father. It's by that spirit that testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. And if we're children, we're heirs and co-heirs with Christ. Galatians 5 says that we know what the acts of the flesh are, right? It's sexual morality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, being a Raiders fan, and the like. And I warn you, as I did before, that people like this won't inherit the kingdom of God. Raiders fans can be saved too, <laughs> just so you know. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. We need to be filled with His Spirit so that we can live out according to His, his ideas. But how do we heal? We, we, we ask the Spirit, Romans 8, 26 says this, in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We don't know how we ought to pray, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Which, by the way, is what leads to the next verse, that he works all things to the good for those who are called according to his purposes if we will let the Spirit intercede in and to and through us, in and through us, then the things that work out for our good are empowered by the Spirit. So here's the thing. There's, I, I've got a bunch of other stuff I could go to, and I'm, I'm, I'm not going to today. I'm going to save it for next week. But there is this diversity in our systems, and diversity can lead to conflict, but we get to choose how we deal with that. We get to choose whether that's healthy or detrimental because all of us are different. All of us walked in here with something different. All of us have a different experience. All of us have a different story. All of us have different gifts and, and, and talents and skills and, and fears and anxieties and hopes. But we all have one purpose. It's to worship, to, is to know God and to make him known. That's the simplest way I know how to say it. But, in order in, but, but because we have diversity of that, we have different opinions and different thoughts and different feelings and different traumas and all of the things. So we get to choose whether those, that diversity is going to be conflicting or it's going to be something that makes us more beautiful and stronger. And the only way that works is if we invite the Spirit of God to come in and show us our hearts. Come in and show us the truth of His Word. Come us and show us where we have failed before we look to the other person's failure. And so there's a, there's a saying, I don't know where I heard this. I tried to look it up and I couldn't find the, the quote. But there's this idea that we are never more like God than when we give and when we forgive. Because God gave, his, his first act was to create and to give. And then when we messed up, his first response 
was to forgive, to create a system and a, and, and a plan by which we could be rescued from our own mistakes. So we're going we're gonna to move into worship again and into giving in a moment and, and prayer. But I, before we do, I just don't want to pass this moment. So every eye closed, every head bowed, nobody moving around. If our hope is that we want to be more like God and we recognize that we are never more like God than when we give or than when we forgive, I want to pray for two groups of people. One, there's a group of people here today that you've been holding back. You have been, hoarding is maybe too strong a word, but you have not been giving your full attention. You've not been giving your full attention value. You've not been willing to, to risk being seen or risk uh, serving others. But, you, but you're here this morning and you're saying, you know what, I, I think it's time for me to, to, to engage. It's time for me to be the people of God instead of point at the people of God. If that's you, I'd like to pray for you. Would you raise your hand? Okay. All right, well, Lord, I thank you for, for this moment and for what you're doing. And Father, I pray that you would help each and every one of us to be willing to give of who we are, of who you've made us to be, because that we as individuals are meant to help all of us. We are a part of the body that is meant to mutually, interdependently function with the rest of the body. And so, Father, would you help us to be willing to, to love you and love our neighbor enough to be willing to give of ourselves, to be able to be willing to, to put ourselves out and risk in community, to be able to be willing to put ourselves out and serve in a way that maybe we haven't before. And so, Lord, would you help continue to make us into the body that you have in mind? In Jesus' name. And to stay, if you wouldn't mind just keeping your eyes closed and your head bowed, if, if you were in a moment this morning where you either recognize that you need forgiveness, that maybe you haven't lived up to your end of the deal, or you recognize that there are ways that you have acted that are contrary to the way that God wants you to act with his people or with your spouse or with your friends or in your work, wherever, if you need to be forgiven and set that right, and ask God to come in and actually order your life in the way that he designed. If that's you, I'd like to, would you raise your hand? I'd like to pray for you. Yep, 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 yep. Okay. Well, Lord, we, we come to you this morning and we say, forgive us. We, we repent, God. We turn away from that which we've done wrong and we turn toward you and we know that Jesus, you are Lord. You are the author and the finisher of our faith. And so Lord, would you forgive us for the ways that we've failed and would you empower us by your spirit to order our lives according to your plan, according to your purpose, according to your word so that we can live to the fullest that you have for us. And so Lord Jesus, we say that you are Lord, that you are in charge. We turn away from the way that we have been living and we turn toward you and ask you to guide us and direct us and to fill us with your spirit so we can hear your voice. We can know the way that you are guiding us and leading us, saying this is the way, walk in it. Don't turn to the right or to the left, but go this way. So we thank you, we honor you, we bless you. And it's in the strong name of Jesus, everyone said, amen. I invite you to stand. We're gonna continue to worship. And then we'll give in just a moment together as an act of worship. But let's sing together and glorify the God of the ages.
to do the same thing for me, for me, for me. Slipped it up. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock of ages. Standing on your faithfulness, on your faithfulness. I'm calling on the God of Mary, whose favor rests upon.
what we feel emotionally all the time. I can think of so many times throughout my life as a believer when tithing and giving to the Lord was painful. And I looked at my bank account, and I looked at Sunday, and I thought, these do not measure up. I can also give you so many times when I have, out of an act of obedience, listening to that spirit, as Pastor Brandon shared, override and overrode my emotion, and, and I just obeyed. And I can tell you time after time after time, the Lord would come through in miraculous ways. I would get a check in the mail. I would have a refund for something, and I didn't let that just happen to us this week. A refund came for something we overpaid. Who does that in this day? Not us. But the Lord also will hold back the enemy from your household when you weren't obediently giving. Do you know that? That means that your dishwasher doesn't break. That means that your car stays. You don't know how your car keeps without repair. That is the Lord holding the enemy back. This is why we just obey and then we trust God. It's a place that makes no understanding. It passes our understanding. So I want to pray for us as we simply obey the Lord and we give this morning of our time and our offering. So Father, I thank you so much. God, that your spirit reveals truth to us. That far outweighs what we feel in our physical body, what we feel in our emotions. Thank you. 